Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Sarah Jemanski, Extension Educator with Purdue Extension. Today, our topic is plant-induced sheep and goat disorders, and we have a special guest presenter today. Connor McCabe is a second year, year master's student studying dairy cattle nutrition in the Department of Animal Science at Purdue University. He is originally from West Lynn, Oregon, where he grew up growing pumpkins and Christmas tree on his family's farm and showing pigs at the county and state fair levels. He did his undergrad in animal science at Cornell University, where he took part in a summer internship in northern New York, looking at the effects of bird's foot trefoil pasture on lamb internal parasites and weight gain. This semester, he is a teaching assistant for the forage management course and will be talking today about the negative impact of certain plants on small ruminant health and how to manage them. So again, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box directed either to everyone or to the presenter. And Connor is going to answer your questions between the different sections of the presentation. So Connor, if you want to go ahead and take it away from here. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction, Sarah. Um, I'm, of course, uh, serving as teaching assistant for forage management here at Purdue. I'm still not up yet. Um, well, I want to send a message out to everyone, uh, wherever you may be tuning in. Thank you for tuning in and I'm hoping that uh, everyone is safe and well um, as we start learning about plant-induced sheep and goat disorders and why the sheep and goat pictured um, on our title slide here are not feeling so great, doing so well after the plants they consumed. So firstly, I want to start by defining what is a disorder that we're going to see in our livestock. Um, and an animal disorder is a disposition that makes the animal susceptible to become sick. And the way that I want us to think about this and how do we prevent this within our flocks um, or herds is going back to the plant side of things. I'm mean, thinking about disease in plants with the idea of a disease triangle. And, this, and the idea of a disease triangle, you have to have three important uh, components in order for that disease to occur. We have to have a susceptible host, which in any case here is going to be our sheep or goat, a pathogen, which is going to be the um, piece causing that disorder to occur, or a conducive environment um, that allows that pathogen or toxin to be present in the environment. And with the presence of all three of these together at once, it leads to the development of disease or disorder within our animals. So the way we can think about management and how can we avoid these is removing one piece of the, of the disease triangle um, in order to prevent it from occurring um, or recurring um, at any given time. So think about these um, ways we can manage each of these disorders as we go through them. Um, through all pieces of the presentation. So starting first, I want to start with forages uh, being the main piece uh, um, of feed stocks for our animals. Um, and we're going to start firstly with the disorder of bloat. Uh, bloat um, can be attributed to a fast consumption of numerous number of legumes. Um, and this occurs through the rapid fermentation of these legumes. So if we look at the rumen uh, reticulum schematic here, we see that when animals consume lots of forage, they'll have uh, gas production off that forage. And traditionally, uh, this gas um, is removed through the esophagus and belched out by the ruminant. However, when they experience cases of bloat, this gas pocket becomes trapped up here in the top layer of the rumen and causes the animal to distend and bloat, um, as can be seen um, with this sheep here, where her sides are completely distended from uh, her inner body outward um, and as the ability to, if not treated, uh, leads ultimately death. Um, in the short term, treatments for about these is using a quick um, way to save the animal is using 
uh, puncture the rumen with a trocar uh, to allow that gas to quickly release. However, we don't want to do that all the time as we're going to leave our animals susceptible to foreign pathogens um, and other complications for that. So a better long-term strategy we can use um, is ensure that our pastures um, are only containing 50% legumes at this part so that we reduce the bloating factor or using legume species um, such as bird's foot trefoil or BFT, which is located in that bottom left picture um, as a legume substitute that we can use to prevent uh, this disease from occurring in terms of a long-term management strategy. Secondly, moving to fescue toxicosis. Um, this is a disorder that we'll see develop in late spring, early summer, around when periods of heat stress start occurring in our flocks, wherever in warmer environments and be most, most prevalent. And this causes, this occurs through an endophyte fungal growth um, that's present in our tall fescue. Uh, pastures and it being an endophyte uh, means that it's growing within the plants and if we look at the top right photo here you look and see this squiggly line here uh, that's the production of that endophyte fungal growth um, which leads and here's a second one here and a third one here and a fourth one here and this leads to the production uh, toxic um, ergot alkaloids within the forage. And when animals consume that, um, it leads to the development of constriction of blood vessels and lameness uh, within the body, as well as other symptoms of being poor doers, not necessarily looking the best, having a rough coat appearance, um, and just generally not wanting to um, be as active or going forward. One main way that we can diagnose this in animals, besides looking at how they are on the outside, is because it leads to uh, blood vessel constriction. This also creates um, a sense of heating within the, the hooves or feet of each animal. So this will lead to a sensation of heat production at the foot level. And you'll see animals standing in water uh, bodies of water to help try to cool themselves down uh, due to the, the development of fescue toxicosis. So some ways we can think about managing uh, tall fescue uh, paddocks is we can either remove our livestock so that there isn't the possibility for them to consume that. We can clip the tall fescue to the vegetative state which is uh, reduces the opportunity for that, that fungal growth to occur. So if we clip it short, uh, shorter, um, or we can include legumes um, in the stand, um, such as portions of clovers um, and other, other legume forages to reduce the opportunity that those animals are consuming fescue alone, um, reducing the risk of fescue toxicosis. Um, additionally, um, thinking about other um, disorders, we want, I see there's questions coming in, um, keep those questions coming. I'm going to answer those uh, when we get to a section break, um, but please don't, don't stop it when yourself from putting a question in when that um, idea comes to your head. Um, the third uh, the disorder I want to talk about is milk fever, or uh, the scientific term hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia is signified by low blood calcium. And this occurs most often in the first few days after kidding or lambing in goats and sheep, respectively. Um, symptoms that develop uh, from this disorder, as the animals will seem nervous, uh, they'll have a reduced appetite and in extreme situations, they'll have a recumbency to stand, as is shown in this U here, um, suffering from low blood calcium um, due to the fact that 
milk production has such large calcium demands for that and because during their late pregnancy uh, st situation they are uh, not don't have very low calcium requirements and that um, physiological state change in order from having low calcium to high calcium requirements uh, can make it difficult for those animals to overcome that change and therefore can result in this low blood calcium and milk fever uh, hypocalcemia um, outcome. Some calcium can be consumed uh, through pre mixes or through forages, um, but treatment when we get to this severe state of where our sheep it, or goats get down and are not able to stand back up um, is wanting to look at treatment uh, with a calcium bolus or calcium gluconate uh, intravenously uh, by contacting your vet so that we can rapidly increase the amounts of calcium in the blood of our livestock and therefore improve uh, their overall health and ability to continue on with their lactation and support their growing kids or lambs. Moving on to our fourth disorder we're going to talk about today, uh, thinking about nitrate poisoning in our livestock. Uh, nitrate poisoning uh, can, has the symptoms of animals will look like they're staggering or having a rapid pulse uh, within them. And this occurs in forages that are either drought stressed or over fertilized specifically the warm season grasses. And one warm season grass that we commonly think of this occurring in is uh, corn crops um, that we're feeding to uh, either finishing animals or um, growing livestock. And we see an example of what our drought stress corn looks like. It looks depressed, not able to have that full vigor to it. And this can be defined um, at levels where forage has greater than 5,000 ppm parts per million of nitrates uh, should not be directly fed to our animals, uh, but should be fed with, should be diluted out um, with other forages so that we prevent our animals from consuming lots of nitrates at one time, um, or look at creating a total ration that decreases the amount of nitrates that animals consume at one time. Um, and if you're gonna be making corn silage for from a corn crop that has experienced drought stress or is that susceptible to this toxic levels of nitrates, um, look at increasing the chopper height um, of the level at which you take that corn silage harvest because the lower foot of that corn plant is where the nitrates are going to be stored because nitrogen is immobile in the plant. Um, so if you bring that chopper height that much higher, you will not harvest um, that the, uh, where the concentrated of nitrates are um, and avoid that problem. So they look at if you do harvest it, look at dilution opportunities, other feedstuffs, or avoid harvesting that portion of the corn plant. We talk about nitrate poisoning, now moving into prussic acid poisoning, um, which is very common in all sorghum type grasses. Uh, sorghum type grasses being sorghum um, and sorghum sedan grass, um, as well as the noxious weed Johnson grass, uh, we'll talk about, as well as it's also present in all cherry tree species. So this makes it important that if we have Cherry trees next to our sheep and goats, or that after a storm we have uh, limbs that fall, that fall down or go over the fence into our paddocks. Uh, we need to clear those uh, right away, as these can lead to the consumption by the animals and leading to poisoning through prussic acid production. Animals that are exhibiting the symptoms of labored breathing and frantic pine at the ground, um, consume prussic acid. Um, they generally have the appearance of not, not wanting to move, looking very dull in appearance, breathing heavily, um, and in those extreme situations um, can be pine at the ground. 
uh, the way this occurs in our specific forages is after we have a freeze damage, um, like I know last night in Indiana, we got um, down below freezing. Um, this causes the release of the prussic acid in forage and tillers. Um, and then when that's released, it goes into the forage tissue, animal consumes it, and that leads to a detrimental impact, um, as we can see here. So thinking about how can we prevent this, we want to look at species um, that do not contain prussic acid that we're going to be grazing or feeding our animals with. Um, and one example of forage that we can use in this case uh, would be millet um, opportunities. Moving on to a disorder that we may not see as commonly um, in parts of the country anymore as would have been 50, 60 years ago is white muscle disease. And white muscle disease is most commonly seen in very young animals um, that are either born uh, severely weak or dead on arrival, um, kids and lambs. And so if we see this um, historical photo here of this sheep, um, this lamb recently born, um, who uh, looks rather weak, uh, and then meat uh, muscles from that, from an animal with that white muscle disease, uh, the, the muscles appear whitish in color because uh, it leads to de degeneration of the muscle tissue as, as um, selenium is an important uh, micronutrient that helps with muscle function and overall bodily health. And animals that consume sufficient deficient forage, selenium deficient forage, or their dams, the mother um, sheep or goat who are deficient in selenium will lead to reduced selenium transfer to the growing kid or lamb by consuming forage or not receiving the proper pre premix. In Indiana, we have to be cognizant of why why this was such um, a greater issue beforehand is if we look at selenium concentration in soil distribution around the country, we see that uh, Indiana is one of those states with very low selenium soil concentrations, um, as you can see from the eastern Midwest up through the northeast um, and parts of the northwest and southwest um, are very low in selenium soil concentrations. Um, but with more technologies and advances that we have, uh, we have the opportunity um, to provide selenium to our animals and other uh, avenues through um, supplements and feed or through um, injections, providing selenium uh, widely available to our livestock. Moving on to another forage in sweet clover. Now, sweet clover has had many advantages for human health um, over time, and, and sweet clover can be identified by this three leaflet shape and the serrations on the edge of all three leaves. And if you take a piece of sweet clover in your hand and rub your hand, rub it between your fingers and smell it, it will sm smell like spearmint gum um, and, and quite, quite a lovely smell. However, the negative effects we can see with sweet clover. Um, sweet clover has the compound decumerol um, that can be present in it when there's moldy hay produced from it. And the reason sweet clover has had such advances in human health is that it is commonly used as an uh, anticoagulant uh, for preventing blood clots um, in individuals for, for several years. However, when we start feeding this to animals, uh, this anti-clotting factor, dicumerol, uh, can prevent animal blood from clotting, which makes them more susceptible to bleeding from the nose, uh, hemorrhaging, um, and they'll also have pale mucous membranes as compared to um, if, if they didn't consume this. So they have a difficulties in, in blood clotting and can lead to ultimately death and bleeding out if not treated. So if we have, which I know sweet clover is not used as prevalently today as it previously has, 
um, for animal, animal feed source. But if we ran into issues with this here again, we would want to supplement with vitamin K or looking at the potential extreme case of blood transfusions so that animals can have the proper clotting factors and ensure that their blood clots um, at, a, at an appropriate rate and prevent them from, from bleeding out through this, um, through the poisoning of through dicumarol. Speaking about phytoestrogens, um, the important, it, great importance with small ruminants. Uh, phytoestrogens um, are a series of hormones found in legume forages uh, and found commonly in nature. These are just four examples of the groups that they uh, belong to, flavanols, isoflavines, lignans, and stilbenoids. These phytoestrogens, um, they mimic other steroid hormones within the body. Um, it can be um, inverted between one or the other. And, the, and if animals consume large amounts of them, which they're found in legumes, um, this can interfere with the reproductive cycle of our sheep and goats, which can lead uh, to prevention of them being able to get successfully pregnant. Um, and relate to that reduction in reproductive efficiency uh, long term through their cycle. So what we want to do in managing our, our livestock is potentially looking at remove animals from legume pasture just prior to breeding season. And then after breeding is successful, we can move our livestock back on to legume pastures um, as that provides the greater um, greater um, production um, and that provide those nutrients they need for um, the growth of the fetus um, and further um, nutrition they need to thrive. I see another question has come in. Um, I think we have two or three more slides before we'll get to a section break and start talking more about them. Now we're talking about Listeria and botulism, which are two toxins produced by um, different bacteria. And they are consistently on forages um, when harvested from the field, either if they've been contaminated from the soil um, or contaminated by other animals in, in, in our forage fields. Um, as mentioned, and they can survive in, if we poorly ferment our silages um, or prevent um, mold production on our crops. So in order to prevent these two, uh, we must ensure that there's a rapid pH decline uh, during fermentation um, and a stable pH concentration to prevent the problem. And what that looks like is when um, having our silage um, phases we want to ensure that at the time of ensiling, we have a rapid drop in oxygen, create the anaerobic environment. And then furthermore, those lactic acid bacteria start increasing in population number to ensure that rapid pH to decline, to kill off any um, of these bacteria that may be present that um, can negatively produce toxins that impact um, animal health, and also why it's a major um, interest for human health and food science safety. And make sure that that pH is um, held at a stable low rate over time, and that we can keep that anaerobic, um, anaerobic environment. If we think there's going to be difficulties in long-term storage, um, or with packing our silos um, or forage, forage bunks. Uh, we want to consider application of inoculants um, at storage so that we can uh, promote that rapid pH decline um, and add sort of an insurance so that we can prevent, um, can prevent this from, uh, can ensure that the rapid pH decline uh, occurs and so that we don't have or fermentable um, quality silage profiles. 
production of Wasteria and botulism toxins. On the same note, um, as with previous toxins, we want to talk about mycotoxins now. Uh, mycotoxins um, is originates instead of a bacteria, it's a fungus. Um, and these grow on silage molds um, when silage enters an anaerobic phase um, during the fermentation or feed out phases um, from the previous graph. And what these can look like is if we zoom in on our top figure here and see this dark spot growing here, there's a mold, presence of mold here, as well as um, this whitish color mold here. Um, and this happens, this can occur when we ferment our silage, but then leave it uh, available and out to oxygen uh, for too long before we feed it to livestock. Um, and this growth leads to those um, toxins. And if we feed this to our livestock, um, it can result in an increase um, in abortions in our livestock um, and lead to negative production performances. So in thinking about how can we prevent this, we can, if it's already happened, um, we can look to add binders to the diet or total mixed ration, um, or simply discard this portion of the silage and not feed it uh, to our livestock. And the last uh, disorder we wanna talk about before we get into uh, the first question break um, is asking about the Japanese U. Uh, while the Japanese knew you is not um, native to Indiana. Um, it's commonly used in landscaping um, around houses um, to uh, beautify um, and often used in Christmas um, wreaths um, and other um, holiday time decorations. Um, however, this contains poisonous alkaloids that can cause abnormal heart rhythms um, if animals were to consume them, which of course they're not gonna be out there in the pasture or paddock, but if someone is looking to landscape their property and trim the hedges or the huge bush down um, and throw the remainder of the you uh, plant that they just trimmed off into the pasture and animal consumes that, um, of course that can lead um, that can lead to um, uh, disorders. And because of that, um, it has led to um, the Purdue Veterinary Tox Toxicology Lab um, has reported many cases annually of this eutoxicosis um, and leads to um, many calls on farm that are um, unfortunately usually are not able to um, get there to, to save the animal before it passes. And so it can be a very fast um, acting death from consuming uh, this, this plant. So before we start, that's the end of our forward section, but before we start talking about weed-based animal disorders, I want to see what, what, what questions we have so far. Um, and the first one comes in and fescue toxicosis be present in dry forages? Uh, could it be a concern and something to look for uh, in the hay I am feeding? Uh, so I know fescue uh, toxicosis um, can be um, reduced if you take that, um, depends on when you take that, took that harvest, if it was early in the season, um, and it had not been heat stressed yet, then there would not be so much um, for those ergot alkaloids to have been produced um, and be present there. Um, but you have to think about what is the concentration of um, tall fescue in your paddocks and is it um, more than 50% or, or what is it prevalent there? But if you took that late um, harvest um, after a very warm summer, uh, it could be present there in dry forages. 
another question. This was, are phytoestrogens strong enough uh, to alter ovarian cycles? Um, and my belief on this one is that um, if animals were to consume uh, large amounts of legumes um, in pasture, um, this can lead to them that it lead to a disruption in the cycle um, and prevent animals from on their normal cycling schedule. Um, that's why we want to move our animals off those pastures um, during the time of breeding season. Um, then we have a series of questions. Let me, there's quite a few coming in. Let me read them um, to see if there's any overlaps. Um, I want to ask, um, which component of legume will cause the rumen to bloat? Uh, component of legume, I, I do not know that one for sure, um, but I could get back to you on that one. Um, and, and as my, my training background is, is more in animal science and agronomy, but I can definitely look that up. And we see why is selenium variable um, across the US? Um, and that is uh, just with the soil types uh, that we have in the district, the different distribution of soils um, across the country um, being different um, makeup and concentration. Um, and that's why we have that distribution of selenium. And why, why does listeria will increase the pH? Um, listeria, well, um, sorry if I misspoke earlier. But listeria does not lead to increase in pH levels. Um, instead, it's a rapid pH decline will lead to um, um, killing the listeria bacteria that causes that, that toxin. So that's why we want to um, have a rapid pH decline so that we prevent listeria production from being produced um, and poison our animals. Um, have another question um, saying, I have an opportunity to graze my sheep on 50% Timothy orchard grass and 50% red clover pasture. Is there a concern when grazing that the dew is still present in the morning? Uh, so I know um, present in the morning. Now, I don't know if that, that's this directly relevant um, I, I don't know the answer directly, uh, how do it can affect animal health, uh, but that's also something how we can, we can look into, um, I know the prevalence of, uh, black patch fungal growth can be occurring with dewy, uh, red clover pastures, um, black patch can lead to other, uh, disorders, but I know it's present, red, uh, red clover. Yeah, Connor, hello. This is Keith Johnson. Uh -huh. I'm uh, Connor's uh, supervisor as, as a teaching assistant, and I just answered that question for you as we move along. Uh, yes, it can be more of a problem with dew in the morning. So uh, one does need to be cognizant of that, particularly when you have that amount of clover in the field. I'd be very careful and uh, not want them out on that uh, uh, wet, wet forage from dew or from a recent rainfall. Thank you for that, Keith. Um, and then we have one more question asking, um, is it best to avoid feeding alfalfa hay and alfalfa pellets around breeding season? Um, and while we can include um, portions of legumes um, in, our, in the diet of our animals during breeding season, uh, we don't want that to be the only feed source for animals um, to prevent high consumption of phytoestrogens so as long as that's incorporated into the diet and makes um, up, it can make up a portion of it, but it should not be uh, the total, um, uh, it should not be the only ingredients provided in the diet. Um, but thank you for your question on that. 
Um, and that's all the questions having right now. But now we want to talk instead about forages. Uh, we want to talk about weeds um, and thinking about um, their um, another category of plants um, and how can we manage those for uh, production, especially for animals out on pasture. So before we get into specific weeds, I want to start um, by, by talking about ways that we can scout our fields for different weeds to help identify them and, and what, how can we determine what is actually in our uh, pastures. Um, so a perfect time to start this is in the spring, um, like we're all experiencing right now. Um, and using a resource guide um, or information uh, from Purdue Extension or wherever, which state you may be in. Um, walking across the field um, and document the number of species identified in their maturity. Um, so looking at both, one, how prevalent are they? And two, um, what's the maturity of them um, in your stand? Um, identify which of those weeds have a threat to your livestock. Um, and uh, what's the impact of that? We need to remember that in most scenarios, livestock will not consume uh, weeds as long as there's plentiful pasture available. Um, but if the pasture is overgrazed and those weeds are the only thing that's present, uh, those animals will, will consume them and that's where we can lead to these toxicity um, and, and negative uh, health implications uh, when they consume these weeds. And then if we think that there's too many weeds um, or that uh, we need to uh, implement some sort of control measures. Um, we can look at four different opportunities um, to implement these in mechanical, which is going through and clipping um, the pasture to remove it uh, from, from the group, from the stand. Uh, cultural opportunities, which includes crop rotation um, and how do we change out um, what we're growing in that area to prevent weed levels from uh, becoming too large uh, biological um, and using grazing pressure or different biological agents to prevent uh, weed production as well as chemical um, and using herbicide um, applications if those are, are deemed necessary and most uh, relevant to remove uh, those weed pressures. And one guide that you can use here in the Midwest um, coming from, from Purdue um, is the weed control guide, which talks about uh, the prevalence of these weeds, how to identify them, and which uh, control measures you can use to rid them from your fields um, from chemical um, up to mechanical cultural biological weed removal opportunities. Um, and the first weed I want to talk about today is cockle burr. Uh, cockle burr, um, if you've ever experienced it within your flock uh, or heard, is probably not something that you, you want to deal with again, um, as these are small, round, prickly burrs uh, that can have pretty much attached to whatever they can. And we know with uh, the wool or uh, fine hair of our animals, we do not <laughs> uh, want want that at all. Um, and I've heard them described as uh, round porcupine eggs <laughs> in, in appearance, uh, and round with the spikes on them. And in each one of these little burrs right here, we can see that they, they each contain two seeds. So if these weeds are not removed from the field, um, they can rapidly multiply and soon you can have them all across uh, pasture. Of course, this can be nuisance to sheep and angora goat handlers, um, ones with very, very prized hair or wool. Um, and we can see this sheep right here and the number of burrs uh, from her head through her neck um, into that lower, uh, uh, lower third of her is just completely covered and that's going to be 
um, an extreme <laughs> difficulty to try to remove those um, and can have a negative impact on wool and mohair quality respectively um, harvested from by our sheep and angora goat handlers and producers. And furthermore, um, if these seeds are consumed, um, it can cause intestinal problems and liver damage. So we see that multiplicative effect. We see the two sides, uh, the effect of this weed um, by if it's consumed or if it's catching on wool and makes ever more um, reason why we may wanna uh, quickly remove it if we can identify it in pasture. Uh, the next one I want to have the opportunity to talk about is horse nettle. Um, horse nettle is, is commonly found in pastures, and as I referred to earlier, uh, livestock commonly avoid consuming this um, as it's less, um, it's not as palatable, and, and as you'll see, it has spines on, on its stem. Um, but if it's the only food source available, then animals will, will consume it. Um, and it's easily, ident it's identifiable, identifiable by the star-shaped flower um, as seen in the top right. If the whitish flower, and we start seeing some of these uh, stem prickles here on the top right, as well as um, the development of thorns on the branches, which makes it um, very, challenging to try to remove by hand. Um, and the overall plant um, has this display um, and it can be identified also by that broad leaf um, look. So look for those uh, spiny stems, the white flowers and the broad leaf uh, display. Um, and this is furthermore even more difficult to control um, due to thick rhizomes. Um, rhizomes are uh, below ground uh, runners that allow for plant propagation. So once the mother, uh, the mother plant has grown up, it will start running horizontally uh, beneath ground rhizomes, which can lead to the production of additional plants um, next to it and further on within the pasture. So if we don't remove this uh, when you first see it in the first season, um, it's gonna grow back um, by the original plant that was there as well as uh, several other uh, daughter plants. Um, and really the, the only ways to, to control horse nettle are looking at opportunities for crop rotation um, or the use of uh, broadleaf herbicides so that we can uh, prevent this from growing up, growing up um, and increasing the population number. Because if we increase, uh, if we don't control it um, in that year one, um, it's gonna lead to much greater uh, hassle in years to come and can be difficult to remove from a pasture once it's fully um, taken over there. Want to talk next about jimson weed? While you may not have specifically seen jimson weed before, uh, you've probably definitely smelled it. Um, I would describe it as um, skunk skunkish, and you, if you rub your hand on its leaves, uh, you will not be able to get that off without. Um, many sessions of soap and water and it carries that distinctive foul order uh, that we determine from rubbing the leaf while it does have the nice um, whitish purplish flower um, if an animal consumes it th this can really lead to increased pulse um, slower respiration and dilated pupils um, and of course in extreme cases um, death. Um, and animals generally avoid this uh, plant as well, um, but if it's the only food source in a paddock or if it's the only uh, source available in forage, um, 
or should I say in, in a hay harvest, if there's lots of jimson weed present, um, then they're going to have to consume it. And if they consume it, then it can lead to these symptoms um, and development of disease. Uh, so make sure that making sure that in hay that you harvest, jimson weed is not present. Um, and if it's in pastures, make sure that it's minimized um, and that you have high quality pasture for your animals to consume. Moving further into nightshade, and I know that this one also has human, human health implications, um, as I commonly talked about, and is most easily identifiable by five fused petals um, that look at a star shape um, and a lavender or dark purple flower. Uh, as we can see in the bottom, very dark purplish in color, um, the idea of nightshade. And the fruits on the nightshade plants will turn this dark purple when they're mature and most toxic. Um, however, when they're still growing and have not reached maturity, they are this green, greenish light green color here. Um, when animals consume parts of the plants, um, it leads to strong um, observing so abdominal pain, vomiting, loss of coordination, um, and all parts of this plant um, are toxic. Um, and it's if you have a per perennial variety um, of the plant, it's going to be more difficult to, to control it as it's going to be keep coming back year after year um, within a paddock or, or pasture. And it's going to be something that is, is commonly occurring, always there. If we harvest this in a hay product and dry it out, uh, the plant becomes less toxic to small ruminants. Um, however, we want to try to avoid, avoid this as much as possible, um, including pasture treatment with a broadleaf herbicide, um, crop rotation, or looking at potentially mechanical control through clipping. Um, if we have annual nightshade, um, um, present in our field instead of the perennial varieties uh, and mowing the pasture will help with control of nightshade. Uh, poison hemlock. Uh, poison hemlock is a biennial. It's common seen along roadsides uh, nowadays and it expands uh, to three to eight feet um, in that year two of growth. Um, it can be observed by small white flowers in umbel fluorescence, um, and the stems will be purple blotched in color um, compared, compared to green. And this will be a plant here in its year two of growth, um, getting massively huge compared to um, the, the surrounding pasture or paddock. Um, and up to, in some cases, up to eight feet tall. Um, control of this weed is more successful um, in its first year as compared to the second year um, before it gets to this stage where it's grown up and, and so large. And, and once it gets to uh, the second year of growth, it can start the production of seeds and release those and lead to a, a persistent problem within the pasture. So being able to control it within that first year is most optimal to prevent it um, in your pasture. And if animals consume this, uh, they're going to have the symptoms of trembling, uh, nervousness, and depression or overall um, dullness and not wanting to um, not wanting to stand or not wanting to go out to, to the pasture with their fellow flock members um, can be detrimental to animal health. And lastly, the last weed I want to talk about, uh, which has the most prevalence um, to those animals that are lactating, is uh, white snake root. Uh, white snake root uh, grows up to four feet tall, um, and it's most prevalent 
in places where animals are grazing in shaded areas or on forest edges. And the plant is usually hairless here, but we can see the flowers produce a white um, presence and we see a very shaded forest environment here where the white snake root is just thriving. So where we're having our sheep and goats graze in pasture, in forest or in pastures that um, jut up against a forest or are heavily shaded, this is where this weed can commonly grow. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a major concern for those animals that are nursing um, or milk producing uh, because of the toxic compound trematone, which can be passed through the milk. Um, and those for their symptoms, um, especially for those young animal, young goats and kids that be consuming the milk from our um, animals that could be consuming this, um, can be trembling, sweating, and those symptoms may not appear until one to three weeks after consumption, uh, which means that we must look forward to controlling this um, early on because if we this leads the development of symptoms, we know that it's that it's too late um, in our, our development timeline and it can negatively impact um, those growing animals um, on their mother's milk. So I want to take a second break here and see if we have any additional questions that may have come in. And we have one here that's asking about um, why can cocklebur seeds cause intestinal problems um, and liver damage? Here. Um, so cocklebur toxin, you asked again. Um, so I know that that they do have a toxic compound uh, within the seeds, but um, with, but I don't know the specific compound that causes uh, the the toxic buildup to occur within um, those seeds and can cause the intestinal problems. I would assume it's some sort of liver degenerative, uh, but we need uh, to look on that. Uh, we have another another question here um, asking, do you know anything about jessamine? I have this in one of my pastures, but there are plenty of other plants as well as good hay. How much should I be concerned? Uh, so I don't know specifically about uh, the weed jessamine, um, but I know that um, to look at if you should be concerned of it, uh, consulting um, Purdue's uh, toxicology or whatever wherever state you may be looking at a, a forage toxicology guide so looking at what level um, is um, becomes a problem for animals uh, to consume uh, that level of weed and at what level uh, does that have a negative impact on their health and production um, for that species um, is, is the best I can tell you but jessamine um, I'll think about that and get back to you. Okay. If there's no other questions now, um, wanting to get into some indirect ways um, that our animals can be affected through um, through forage management and, and nutrient management um, of our crops and, and livestock systems. And the first one uh, I want to talk about is similar to what I discussed from the weeds um, and, and thinking about poor forage quality. Um, 
And poor quality forage available um, means that livestock will consume low nutritive vegetation, um, such as a pasture that looks like above, which is uh, heavily weedy, um, low in all available nutrients um, available for animals to consume, um, and is not high, uh, necessary for the nutrients that animals need to produce and grow well. Um, and this insufficient nutrition um, will lead to the increased likelihood these animals can become sick because they don't have the nutrients uh, to fight off the disease um, or are general poor performers compared um, to other herds or flocks um, in the region. So the first step in mitigating these animal disorders uh, should be investments um, in pasture management and appropriately timed forage harvest. Uh, if we can have pastures um, that appear like this and two steps we can take so that we can have the best forage quality for our livestock um, is looking at forage testing. So what is the quality of the forage that we're harvesting? Um, what is the crude protein or energy component of that? And um, is it meeting the, the nutritional needs of the livestock that we that we have um, in our flock and um, what do we need to do if it's not satisfactory what can we do to get up to that next level uh, through ration balancing and what other components can we add into the diet uh, improve it uh, that much more um, and this can be looking at um, combining forages combining two groups of hay um, that you may need to look at um, or improving um, production by um, looking at pasture renovation um, and crop rotations to minimize weed pressure so that animals can consume something more that looks like this down here rather than uh, the pasture that looks like up here above. And one way we can think about this um, and appropriately timing our harvest and thinking about um, what is the appropriate nutrition that our animals need to eat. So in this scenario, we're gonna have 150 pound really lactating ewe and we have this quality of hay that was harvested. Um, first cutting um, and we went through and did the forage testing on this that was necessary for um, harvesting it, it um, and feeding that to our ewe. So we know that given this 150 pound ewe's um, nutritional needs, she must uh, consume this much of that forage in order to get those nutrients that she needs to consume every day to have high quality performance because she's an early lactation um, and she need, has greater, of course, nutritional uh, needs and demands compared to those uh, individuals that are not pr uh, producing milk, nor are they um, pregnant at that time. However, due to the maturity of this forage that we harvested um, and it's high in fiber, um, these components um, and lower in quality such as um, crude protein and available energy. Um, she can only eat this amount because there's greater amount of fiber within the hay that we harvested and this prevents her and this leads to uh, the, the sensation of stretch factor and because she can only eat this much she has a huge gap between the amount that she should be eating of this forage to meet her demands and the amount that she's actually able to eat. Um, so matching the quality of forage with the animals, um, the animals requirements um, is extremely important so that we can ensure that while we can formulate something that looks like this, that you is never gonna be able to eat that much so we must keep that in mind um, when thinking about 
um, what forage we're feeding to our animals based on their nutritional requirements. And we just have a couple more now, but wanting to just talk briefly about the blister beetle. Um, and this is one uh, variety of the species here. Uh, the blister beetle um, comes, this is the, the black uh, striped, um, but they're all um, this size. And the reason we need to be concerned, um, especially um, not just for our livestock, but for our own um, human health is the blister beetle as so appropriately named, um, has the compound cantharidin with in the beetle. And if this compound cantharidin gets in contact with the human skin, it leads to the development of these pustules um, on the skin surface. Um, and you can just imagine um, what that would happen if um, a and, and sheep or goat were to consume that and what happens the interior of their um, intestines and stomach tract um, and what impact that could have on them both health wise and welfare wise and the way this uh, beetle and its cantharidin can get into forage um, is commonly seen uh, in plain states um, and also in indiana and the southeast portions of the country uh, where we're harvesting hay and we're cutting hay and we're looking to condition it um, so to crack the stems and increase the amount of water um, that is released from the plant to increase the rate that it dries and so we can uh, bale it and store it quicker if these beetles uh, get are in the field and get caught within the conditioner they can also be crushed on the forage and you know it can be dispersed wherever within um, the harvested forage and then it can be a huge management problem at that point because um, how do you look at uh, management managing uh, where where is that uh, cantharidin actually within the the harvested forage an example from just this january is um hay that was found to be harvested out in south dakota um, and trucked into wisconsin um, killed 14 horses um, and sickened uh, dozens more uh, when they consumed hay that was contaminated with blister beetles um, and something we need to think about um, if we're making hay ourselves um, or where we're buying our hay um, if this should be a problem and making sure scout uh, pastures um, and fields for blister beetle um, if this is a, a problem there and one more here and talking about hardware disease uh, hardware disease um, a problem in in can be a problem in all ruminants uh, mainly but in our fields um, especially can be prevalent with those of us harvesting uh, hay um, and hay and um, silages is spare metal is um, often deposited in our fields um, in the winter and springtime when um, there's nothing growing out there just before um, we start planting or the vegetation starts growing um, and this metal which can be Oh, cans, um, different metal debris that's coming from, from our roads. Uh, this metal is harvested with the forage when we come in with the tractor and begin baling or take part in um, chopping uh, corn. Um, and the consumption of this metal by the animal is they're given the forage directly um oftentimes avoid it but if it's mixed in there um within their diet and they can't eat around it it'll lead to the direct consumption of this um, which leads to puncturing the stomach and lead, can lead to internal bleeding um, as can be seen from this photo here this x-ray image we think this is the entire rumen 
um, and the metal um, kind of coagulates or coalesces uh, within the reticulum of the of the animal. Um, and if this animal were to take the wrong term, and this punctures through the stomach, um, this can lead to severe internal bleeding and damage. Um, and one way we try to mitigate this um, is insertion of a magnet um, to help um, bring all the metal um, onto it. And the insertion of the magnet is done through um, a bolus um, given, given to the animal, and that tries to uh, bring all the metal together to prevent it from becoming loose and poking through the side. Um, and this is a mitigation strategy. However, there's no direct way to necessarily remove the animal. Um, and this can uh, lead to uh, development of, of death if it's so extreme and internal bleeding is so harsh. Um, so think about clearing pastures and preventing um, metal sh uh, shards uh, from being deposited. Um, and, and don't be throw, don't be uh, depositing random metal pieces into fields that we're going to be harvesting later on for um, silage or hay. So I want to get into conclusion about some of the things uh, we talked about today from forage disorders, weed disorders, um, and some indirect uh, entomology, um, maturity, and uh, hardware disease. Um, and that there are a variety of pathways that these toxins and forages um, and plants, and as we saw, can affect animal health and lead to different animal disorders of varying levels um, that can be from mild cases all the way through to severe, um, to severe instances, um, including death. Um, but what we should first uh, look at the opportunity is manage all pieces of our forage management plans uh, and what can we do upfront to prevent the disease from occurring in the first place. Um, and thinking about, secondly, if we get one of these disorder, disorders or disease to develop, uh, what can we do to look to implement treatments if they exist so that we can prevent, minimize the amount of time that our animals are experiencing these dis this disorders and getting them back um, to where they should be and maximizing animal health in the long term. So with that, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present um, as a graduate student um, on some of the work I've been, we've been working on in agronomy and forage management this semester. Um, and I don't know how much more time we have, but if anyone else has further questions, um, I can provide that. Uh, I can answer those um, and provide my email um, and follow up if those any more further questions after this should occur. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Connor. I'm just I just now reposted the link to the copy of the presentation. There is a PDF copy of the presentation in that Google Drive folder and a link to the evaluation for this program. So if you could please fill out this program evaluation, go ahead and click on that link and open that up before you leave. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And so if you have any more questions for Connor, you can type them in the chat box and make sure you address them to the panelists, or I mean, to, the, to either all panelists or to the presenter. Thank you so much for your attendance. And Connor, you did a great job. Thank you.